see it, you got to bring a family. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, yeah. <laughs> Your family's more than welcome to hear this. Well, my family's in Brazil, so. Oh. <laughs> in any case, um, I'll be presenting today on adolescent mothers in a quilombo community. Uh, before I start, okay. Before I start, I would like to thank my many advisors, both here and in Brazil, who helped me with this research. When I was in Brazil, I was linked with two organizations that were fundamental in my understanding of the project, which I completed during nine months. Without their help, there is no way that I could have understood what I did, have spoken the Portuguese that I spoke, or have even become connected with the people. And these are some of the people from the island to which I'm infinitely grateful for giving me their time. Also here at UMBC, I would like to thank Dr. Anderson, who has been my amazing advisor throughout this process since sophomore year, and Dr. Bambi Chapin, who is on sabbatical this semester, but has come back to specifically mentor me throughout the course of this project. And I am, I'm very grateful to both of them for all the support and help that they've given me to understanding my data and analyzing it. What is your image of a teen mother? This is the popular image of a teen mother, which is an irresponsible young woman who has become pregnant and is usually at some level abusive to her children. While academics do not participate in such derogatory images, they also consider that teen motherhood perpetuates poverty and that mothers who become pregnant before they should are responsible for their own situation and continuation of that. And that's common throughout all public health literature, a great deal of sociology literature and psychology literature as well. Today, I would like to challenge that assumption, which took me, oh, which took me around nine months to change my own personal opinion about that. Our conception of the adolescent motherhood are so deeply rooted in our own cultural beliefs and our own personal experiences that changing our idea in ten minutes is going to be very difficult. <laughs> However, I would like to take you through my own expectations, which, which when I went to this rural community in Brazil, what I expected to find was mothers who were the victims of their own circumstances, who were unable to take care of their children, and who had lost opportunities to become something else other than a mother through their choice to have a child at an early age. This is the location of my study, and I would like to emphasize that what I'm saying is not true for all Brazilian women. It's not true for all adolescent mothers. Rather, it is true for a very specific geographical region and very specific community within that geographical region. And that's the Ilha de Maré, where I perform my study. It has 7,000 inhabitants, and even though it's close to one of the biggest cities in Brazil, it is extremely isolated, and most people who live in the city have never even heard of it. It takes about a day to get there. So what is this quilombo that I keep talking about? In fact, that's a complex question, but scholars tend to agree that it's a unique ethnic identity and that these communities that are considered quilombos today are formed by the descendants of escaped slaves. In Brazil, until 1888, slavery was a fully functioning institution and, in fact, more slaves were imported to Brazil than into the United States. 56% of the Brazilian population at the end of slavery were black slaves imported from Africa. So it's, a, it's an entirely huge part of the Brazilian culture. And these particular communities were formed by people who escaped slavery to form them and became isolated with their own economic and cultural institutions. In 2003, the Brazilian government started to recognize them, and today there's 1,500 recognized throughout. The state where I did my investigation has the highest concentration of quilombos, and currently 250 are recognized. And this is a picture of the community where I did my study. My primary disciplines were public health and anthropology. From public health, I used epidemiological case series to look at the health outcomes for women in contributing risk factors 
for the mothers who were already on the, on the island. I did surveys with 18 out of the 19 adolescent mothers, and it's important to emphasize that these were all of the adolescent mothers in the community. So it wasn't a sample population, it was all of them. And I also looked at the health records that were in the clinic. From anthropology, I lived in the community for a month and did my, my investigation for three months using participant observation, semi-structured interviews, a life history, and an interactive group meeting. There were conflicts between the results for each of these, and bridging strategies were necessary to resolve these conflicts. The particular two bridging strategies I used were building complex and multi-causal explanations and bridging the explanation action gap. Adolescent motherhood is by no means a simple phenomenon, and neither of the disciplines was adequate to fully describe it. In addition, the results I got from my study in the anthropology aspects would be useless unless they could be applied to the public health clinic on the island. So the second bridging strategy helped me to apply and think about the applications for the study. 18 adolescent mothers seems like a relatively small number. However, there's only 161 total adolescents in the community. So that means that 12% of mothers, of the women in the community were already mothers from the ages of 10 to 19. And almost 60% would become mothers by the time that they were 20. And you can see on the right the age distributions for the participants in my study, which is incredibly important because at the age of 15, the biological consequences of early pregnancy become insufficient inconsequential to non-existent. That means that the only consequences that we can consider from a public health perspective are the social and economic consequences. So what did I find? The physical health of the mothers was generally good, although 33% had some kind of problem during, health problem during their pregnancy. Those were primarily hypertension and anemia. And almost all of them completed the suggested public health uh, appointments, which were the prenatal care, despite the fact that they had to journey a day to do so. So that means they had to go to the city, spend their money to go to have the prenatal appointment, and then come back from the city the next day. So it was a huge endeavor on their part until two years ago when the first public health clinic was constructed on the island. Almost all of them were engaged in low economic labor. They were artisans or shellfishes shell fishing women, and that has a net gain of about $14, $15 per week. So they were very dependent on their father's income and or their boyfriend and husband's income. Also, 69% of them dropped out of school and reported the reason to be their own pregnancy. The themes from the interviews that I had were quite different. In fact, in all these interviews, the women despite the consequences that we see for their having dropped out of school, suggested that the pregnancy was a positive experience for them and that it was part of their life path to becoming adult in the community and receiving recognition. They were proud of their parents' parenting ability and their choice to keep the baby. Also, even though most of them had high hopes and dreams, there was little way that they would be able to go to achieve that. And that's because the public education system in Brazil is very poor. The realization of the epiphany that I had in my study came from this question that I asked. And that was whether the women thought that becoming pregnant affected their opportunities. They didn't say yes and they didn't say no. Instead, they were confused by the question. <laughs> and that's when I realized that's when I was, what I was asking was the wrong question. The opportunities are not affected by early pregnancy and motherhood in Ili Jumare and Praia Grunge. And that is because the opportunities themselves do not exist in the first place. In order to have the kinds of educational, post-secondary, high school, college, or any kind of economic opportunities, the women would have to leave the island and break their kinship structures and families. That is not a viable opportunity or a viable option for most of them. 
And this is why interdisciplinary research was necessary in order to understand them because we can look at the data and say that 69% left school to become a mother. And we can look at the data and see that they are dependent. But unless we talk to the women and see their stories, we cannot understand why that is relevant or not. Now, throughout this, this presentation, you might have questioned yourself, what is the relevance of 18 women from a rural community in Brazil for you and I? So I want to come back here to Baltimore, and I want to come back here to Baltimore City, where I tutored for four years in elementary, middle, and high schools in the inner city. And from that experience, I can tell you that the real opportunities for girls and for young boys in those middle schools and high schools at least for most of them, are non-existent. Therefore, we need to question adolescent motherhood as a public health problem. And we need to look at the fundamental underlying socioeconomic inequalities, that it is not produced these socioeconomic inequalities, but is rather a consequence of the lack of opportunities that we have. It is a symptom and not an exacerbating factor. Now, of course, one month was not sufficient to fully understand this. And for that reason, I'm going back there on a Fulbright in January 2012, and I'm very excited to be able to look at family planning further. Questions? When you go back, what are some additional questions that you want to investigate? One of the things I found was a lot of confusion about contraception on the island, and there's a lot of alternative abortive practices using teas. And I want to look at how the hormonal contraception that is used combines with these, with these teas into more traditional methods, and how people are using them. I also want to look at go to the public school systems and investigate more fully how they function because I heard people's stories about how they work, but I never actually went there. Um, you talked about perception of, of teenage mothers. Um, in the community where you were studying, was there some sort of pejorative looking down on these women, since it was so normative before 20? Was there any sense of looking down on them for having done something they weren't supposed to do? Tentatively, I would say no, but I only spent a month there. Yeah. I didn't see that, and in general, the, they seemed like they integrated with the older mothers almost completely. That might change, because right. just now they're getting access to television and media and all those sorts of things in the past like five years, so those, that might change. Okay, I'm going to ask you another speculative question. Mm -hmm. you, you were sort of par starting to parallel that community with inner city here, mm -hmm. for instance. Yes. What do you expect to find to be different about the two? There's clearly similarities, but what do you expect to find different? I think it's a little bit more complicated here because we have a lot of the questions of drugs and the court systems that they really don't have on the island, which makes it a lot more complicated here to fix the problem than it would be there there it's a largely a question of the public school system and lack of schools on the island. There's only an elementary school on the island, so anyone who wants to get middle school or high school education has to essentially move off the island. Mm -hmm. um, in inner city Baltimore, it's much more complicated because there are good schools and there's bad schools and there's crime and there was essentially no crime on the island where I stayed. You could go out, I could go out alone at one or two in the morning and there would be no problem. Would you like to take a few children from inner city Baltimore with you this summer? Or this next year? I would love to. I don't have the financial resources to. We'll talk to Fulbright about that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, can I ask one, just one more sure, little tag on question? Uh, one of the things seems to me, not having been there with you, is that one of the things that's different about the United States is that there's a lot more um, very apparent salient levels of social class. So inner city is, you know, has as a comparison mid upper middle class and upper class, right? Is that non-existent where you were, which it sounds like? No. No. Not on the island there was not really big differences in social class. There was some, 
but the people who lived there were very aware that they ranked very much on the bottom of social class because they're the people in Salvador don't know who they are, but they very much they have to go to Salvador to which is the the big city that was nearby to sell things to get food to get those sorts of things. So they're very aware that they're at the bottom, and a lot of them are very aware of the racism that's. One of the mo moments in, that I was there that most broke my heart was I was talking to an older fishing woman who couldn't believe that I was living with a family because she said that no white Brazilian would ever live with a black family. And I couldn't believe that I got credit for that. And it, it just, that just tore me up. All right. Uh, last question? Go ahead. Uh, um, so why do you, you started this project thinking there's this problem and I want to go and understand it. And in the end, you're talking about how it's a symptom rather than the, the cause. But why is it a problem? Why is why is young motherhood a problem at all? I mean, I know why we think it's a problem, mm -hmm. but what did you see that led you to think that it was a problem for the people there? I don't think it's a problem in the sense that it's a negative thing. I think that um, why when I call it a rest? symptom, when I call it a symptom, I mean that it's showing that something else is going on. Not that it's necessarily a bad thing in and of itself, which I don't think it is. I think that it shows that the women there aren't having these opportunities, and that's apparent both here and in Praia Grande. But maybe that I think it gets in a lot of questions about the development projects and the, their basis for assuming that a certain type of economic and educational level needs to be adequate to have a good life. But I think that if there was these opportunities available, it would be better in general for the women if they could have the option of which they would prefer to choose. And so I think that the fact that it shows that there isn't that option there, in, the, in, in that sense, it's a problem.